have employed their music and personae to negotiate and perform Cuban American nostalgia and identity. Their musical and political commentary parallels the evolving attitudes of Cuban Americans towards Cuba and its politics. Each successive artist is a little more ambiguous about her or his political leanings in the American political sphere, but all of them have opposed Cuba's communist regime while trading in the musical currency of nostalgia for the Cuba of yesteryear. In the vein of Gustavo Perez Fermat's watershed analysis of Cuban Americans' hyphenated identity, these artists demonstrate how such an identity exists in a liminal cultural space that lives in the present and plans for the future with one foot planted firmly in the fantasy of an Eden-like past. So I'm gonna start off with Celia Cruz. So what comes to mind when you hear Celia Cruz? Azúcar. Azúcar, exactly. Anything else? La Vida en Carnaval. All right, salsa music, hopefully, all right. Uh, so born in Havana in 1925, Celia enjoyed a successful career as a lead singer of La Sonora Matencera. She left in 1960, more than a year after Castro seized power, never to return again. Musical collaborations in the U.S. with Tito Puente, Johnny Pacheco, and Willie Colon led to her being dubbed the Queen of Salsa and the Queen of Latin Music. The former is a significant accolade, seeing as how salsa has historically been and still is a male-dominated genre. Celia found success in the Spanish language music market, but was mostly unknown throughout the US English speaking population. Despite her relative lack of name recognition, she was arguably the most famous Cuban American since Desi Arnaz of I Love Lucy fame in the 1950s. Unlike Desi, who was born and raised in Cuba, but attended high school in the US, Celia moved to the US as a 35 year old. Hence, I describe her as a first generation Cuban American. Like other post-1959 Cuban immigrants to the U.S., she positioned herself as an exile, hoping to return to the homeland she was forced to flee. In referring to themselves as exiles, Cuban Americans followed in the footsteps of other groups who differentiated themselves from other immigrants by describing their reasons for their moves as traumatic ones that required special services and protections. Intriguingly enough, and I'll get into this in a second, is the one way Celia did not match the demographics of this first generation of exiles was the fact that she was black. All the same, Cuban culture and nostalgia served as a marketable framework for her music. When she arrived in the US amid 1960s counterculture, her style of music was anachronistic. It was not until a critical mass of Hispanics began to commercially and culturally Latinize major cities such as New York and Miami that ethnic pride allowed for the widespread commercial success of Caribbean music. The music for which Celia is best known, salsa, is often considered an amalgamation of Cuban traditional styles such as son, guaracha, and rumba with the bombas of Puerto Rico, the merengues of the Dominican Republic, and the cumbias of Colombia. Celia explained that, quote, now you say salsa and everything fits. She knew that salsa was simply an accessible marketing term that defined the, in the ineffable. With the advent of salsa as a way to promote her music, Celia became the genre's queen with her formidable contralto singing voice and impeccable improvisation skills. Throughout the counterculture movements of the 60s and 70s, Celia avoided explicit political references in her songs, whether about Cuba or the US. This tactic set her apart from more political artists that you might know, such as Willie Colon and Ruben Blades. The lyrics of Celia's songs are steeped in bucolic nostalgia. From songs such as the wistful Cuando Salí de Cuba to Cuba Que Lindos Son Tus Paisajes, her songs speak of a country that is unreachable and utopian. Selective memories and arguably fabricated memories are the building blocks for Celia's songs about Cuba. Acknowledging the etymological roots of utopia, meaning nowhere, one can easily see how the Cuba that Celia sings about is unreal. These songs allude to a Caribbean island named Cuba, but delimit it to a place of love, laughter, and song that excludes political turmoil, systemic racism, and widespread poverty. The songs are imbued with an idealistic view of a pre-communist nation that appeals to Cuban Americans. As an exile, Celia reminded listeners that her home had been stolen from her and millions of others. Regardless of how popular her music became throughout the Latin American world, her identity as a Cuban singer was foremost in people's minds. Fans wanted to hear her yearn for the Cuba of yesteryear and evoke its jovial communities, pastoral vistas, and vernacular rhythms. Nostalgia, of course, can be a political act, so to describe all her songs as apolitical would be a, mo a misnomer. 
1969's Yo Soy La Voz is an excellent example of how Cruz utilized nostalgia to discreetly express political sentiments. Here's a brief clip of her, hopefully the music works, uh, performing the song in Venezuela in the early 1980s. I know we want to keep hearing her sing, but we've got to move on. So in the song, she proclaims that her voice is the embodiment of Cuba, particularly the capitalist Cuba of yesteryear. Yo soy de Cuba la voz, soy de la Cuba de ayer, soy el símbolo del son, soy caña y café, soy el sabor tropical. Celia engages with simile, metaphor, and metimony, metonymy, metonymy to embody the ideal of pre-revolutionary Cuba. The nostalgic emphasis on La Cuba de Ayer is coupled with idyllic references to the island's musical traditions and agricultural industries. The anaphoric repetition of the first person I in successive declarative phrases underscores her pride, confidence, and resoluteness. If the listeners assent to, Cuba, to Celia's claim to embody Cuba, then there is also an implicit approval of Cuba's pre-revolutionary attitudes about racial difference. As a colony and as an independent country, Cuba's hierarchy was predicated along racial lines and pigmentocracy, wherein someone like the Afro-Cuban Celia could never be a fully integrated member of elite society. And yet the song's racial blinders are concomitant of first-generation exile politics that dismissed the existence of racial problems in Cuba and claimed that Castro had invented them to solidify his power. Although the communist regime promised racial equality, Many Cuban studies experts see little such racial egalitarianism in the country's political, economic, or academic sectors to this day. In fact, when I was in Miami last week, there was an article in the Miami Herald about a black Cuban artist in Miami talking about the racism that still exists there, even while they now have a Afro-Cuban vice president with the new regime. The verse may dwell on the country's musical and agricultural currency, but its political connotations cannot be ignored given Celia's identity as an exile. A more critical eye would question the song's metonymic powers when considering Celia's race. As we will see, politics and ethnicity trump considerations of race in, Cuba, in Celia's music and in the rhetoric of white Cubans who celebrate her as their own in the name of anti-communist discourse. Yo soy libre como el viento, y con mi canto sincero, mi voz alza en el destierro, con profundo sentimiento. Porque llegará el momento cuando haya libertad, El son que se fue de Cuba algún día volverá. There's English there for folks who don't understand it. These verses elicit a significant emotional response in exile. The song's vision of freedom's return to Cuba underlies the hope that Cuban Americans have lived and died with since 1959. The image of son's return to Cuba is problematic because it implies that authentic Cuban music is no longer performed there. The lyrics align genuine Cuban music with capitalism and democracy. Hence, without naming individuals, political parties, or international policies, Celia's song, like so many of her others, presents a political posture that is representative of most first-generation Cuban Americans' conservative beliefs. Nostalgia can be described as a result of a retrospective idealization of lost objects that helps the immigrant defend against the aggression resulting from current frustrations. Celia's music, therefore, is steeped in nostalgia and committed to replicating and rep reproducing Cuban culture through music and lyrics that offer a simulacrum to console fellow exiles. Her music is simultaneously a soothing blanket and a defensive bulwark for Cubans in exile. It comforts and it shields. The music's ability to shield Cuban Americans from the uncomfortable aspects of exile is double-edged, for it erases the harsh realities of their former homeland which is recreated through an idealistic lens that belies historical realities and the underlying reasons why the revolution succeeded. Celia made it clear that she would not perform in Cuba, in Cuba while an authoritarian regime was in power. As a first generation exile, her desire to avoid the communist state matched the majority of Cuban Americans from the 60s through the 90s. Florida International University has continually conducted reliable surveys of the community since 1991 when 87% of Cuban Americans supported the embargo and only 44% supported unrestricted travel to Cuba. 
And I say it's easy to assume that these numbers were respectively higher and lower throughout the previous decades before they started the survey, when exiles voted for Republicans in overwhelming numbers and opposed even the slightest hint of amicable relations with the Castros. Although Cruz was not, although Celia was not partisan in her music, she was conservative when it came to American politics. When Ileana Ross Layden was elected to Congress in 1989, the Miami Herald referred to her win as, quote, the crowning political achievement of Miami's exile community, a triple milestone wherein she became the first Cuban American, first Republican, and first woman in Congress elected from Dade County. Celia was at the victory party, and she joyfully shouted, the Cubans won. Celia followed the political patterns of her ethnicity rather than her race, seeing as how more than 96% of non-Hispanic blacks voted for the Democratic candidate. Even in Miami, one of America's most polyglot cities, multiculturalism does not lead to racial equality. I know there's several folks from Miami in here who could speak to that perhaps. Miami's black community has, not, has traditionally been composed of a mixed group, Bahamians, Jamaicans, Haitians, and African Americans descended from enslaved Africans of the American South. Despite the geographic and economic stratification of these groups, intra-racial tensions were eclipsed by a shared resentment over what they argued was the special treatment of Cubans throughout the 60s. According to historians, African Americans in Miami, quote, watched in disbelief as Cuban black and mulatto children attended white schools, prompting one local minister to write that the American Negro could solve the school integration problem by teaching his children to speak Spanish, end quote. Historian Marvin Dunn argues that the arrival of Cubans in Miami in the 60s was detrimental to black Miamians because it, quote, diverted attention from Miami blacks during the crucial integration period with federal support for education, health, housing, and economic development suddenly being given to Cuban exiles, most of whom were from the upper and middle classes and looked as white as the Anglo population of South Florida. This perceived racism was exacerbated when Haitians arrived in Florida to claim political asylum, just like Cubans did, but were routinely rejected. You might remember that in the 1990s when Clinton was president, all the controversy surrounding that. These ethnic and racial tensions further elucidate how significant it was that Cuban-American whites celebrated Celia as their musical raconteuse. Speaking of color, identity, and symbolism, as we said earlier, you can't help uh, but hear the shouts of Azuka when you think of Celia. Her 1998 song, Azuka Negra, seamlessly explodes the oxymoronic image of black sugar. As a black woman constantly channeling the image of white sugar, a good for which so many Africans were enslaved in the white-owned plantations of Cuba, she challenges the meaning and etymology of the signifier by embodying the signified and transforming the image of refined white sugar to an African-blooded concoction that thrives under hegemonic colonial discourse and oppressive racism. Celia's appropriation and embodiment of sugar is a rich evocation of Cuba's vis visceral pleasures of the soil. So there she's saying, Llevo el rímico tumbao de África en el corazón, hija de una isla rica, esclava de una sonrisa, soy de ayer, soy carnaval, pongo corazón y tierra, mi sangre es de azúcar negra. Celia's proud ties to African rhythms are integral to Cuba's national music identity. The music of Cuba's countryside, Musica Guajira, is indebted to romance ballads introduced by Spanish colonizers. The traditional styles of these songs stood in contrast to the polyrhythmic African-influenced sones that would later be reconfigured as salsa. The popularity of this latter genre coincided with the spread of records and radio broadcasts in the 1920s, which made it possible for the songs and rhythms of black people to be listened to and danced to in white people's homes, and for black people to find an unexpected place of coexistence with whites, a space where instead of being marginalized, they were recognized and acclaimed. Racial difference was reclaimed by Celia throughout her career as male musical partners of all races would affectionately refer to her as negra or the possessive mi negra, to which she would reply obsequiously with a shout or the song's next verse. Whether she highlights her status as the paradoxical azuca negra of salsa or proudly sings that la negra tiene tumbao, Celia simultaneously highlights her negritude 
and her cubanidad, so that the two are one and the same. Just as she saw her nationality slash ethnicity before her race, Celia was always a champion of all things Cuban. Even though her definition of salsa served to reaffirm a pre-socialist Cuban national identity racialized as white, Joe Arapicio eloquently argues that it is, quote, interesting, but not necessarily contradictory, that despite Celia's urban working class black origins, she would become a central spokesperson for the politics of the early white bourgeois landholding Cuban exile community. I argue that Celia's struggles did not always have to be about blackness. For her, being a Cuban American spokesperson was enough of a burden without having to constantly negotiate race, sex, and class. Nostalgia, heartache, and a live and let live attitude, such as Déjeme Vivir la Vida, were her musical staples for the radio stations and dance floors of the world. As years of exile became decades, and a new century ushered in a younger generation of Cuban Americans less concerned with ousting the Castro regime, Celia's outlook on returning to Cuba grew more doubtful. A common tradition at many Cuban American New Year's Eve parties during the first decades of exile was to pop champagne bottles with the proclamation, El año que viene lo hacemos en Cuba. This custom has grown increasingly bittersweet and in many families, obsolete. In a similarly weary vein, on her 2000 track, Por si acaso no regreso, a tangibly tired Celia recognizes that she will probably never see Cuba again. After decades hoping and fighting from the U.S., Celia's heart sinks as she is forced to accept that her dreams will not come true. Ay, ya me está matando ese dolor. Me matará el dolor. Siempre te quise y te querré. Me matará el dolor. The employment of ya implies that the weight has gotten the best of her. She is finally succumbing to the pain of being separated from Cuba. Celia metatextually references the song and her musical output in one final wish when she says, quote, que me entierran con la música de mi tierra querida. Bury me with my music, the music of my beloved homeland. Her singing voice has embodied the love, dreams, and frustrations of millions of Cubans. And so she asked to be buried with the music of her life and her people. Many fans would say that Celia was a viscerally Cuban musician, despite enjoying the bulk of her success in the US. Celia cherished her adopted homeland, but always yearned for the Cuba of yesteryear. She made sure that after she died in 2003, that her body would be taken to Miami for one final goodbye, to be as close to Cuba and the Cuban American heartland as possible before being buried in the Bronx. Her wake in Miami attracted hundreds of thousands of people who stood in line outside the Freedom Tower, which is this building in the top right corner, which is known as the Ellis Island for Cuban Americans. That's where most of them were processed when arriving in the US, particularly in the 1960s. Uh, to pay final respects to Celia, whose cadaver, of course, was decked in a platinum blonde wig, sequin gown, flashy jewelry, and hot pink lipstick. <laughs> Celia, like many first-generation Cuban Americans, could not discard her Cuban American identity, idioms, or ideologies, even if she wanted to, which she did not. Celia's coffin was draped in a Cuban flag, and the last-minute citywide logistics required to organize the public wake were organized by one of the women for whom Celia broke down doors in the American music industry, Gloria Stefan. And you see her here with Emilio and Pedro uh, Knight, Celia's husband there. So what comes to mind when you hear Gloria Stefan? What? Conga. Conga. Mi tierra. Mi tierra, Miami sound machine. Yeah. All right, good. During Celia's notable but limited commercial success in the US, the country's first full-scale engagement with Cuban-inspired music in the rock and roll era, so again, that's post-rock and roll era, not some of the mambo songs right before that, such as Perez Prado and others, uh, came thanks to Gloria Stefan and the Miami sound machine. Gloria, along with her husband Emilio, achieved unparalleled achievement in the mainstream pop music world. They did so with songs that contained a unique blend of American top 40 structural sensibilities and tropical rhythms. The songs were mostly in English with some peppering of Spanish phrases here and there that made them accessible to Americans of all stripes. Gloria's signature song, 1985's Conga, stood testament to this formula when it became her first top 10 hit as well as the first song in history to crack Billboard's pop, dance, black, and Latin charts simultaneously. In the eight years prior to Conga, the band released more than a dozen singles without any impact on the Hot 100. They were all in Spanish. 
Although Spanish language music would not launch them to fame, a song with a Spanish title did. As subsequent number ones and Grammy awards would prove, Gloria achieved a crossover appeal that eluded Celia. Gloria became a crossover sensation by infusing her songs with enough Latin rhythms and Spanglish lyrics within a mainstream pop framework that hits such as the tribal tinge 1987's Rhythm Is Gonna Get You and the progressive chords of 1989's Get On Your Feet were welcoming liminal spaces for non-Hispanic fans to get caught up in the music and Gloria's emblematic Cuban-American narrative. Part of Gloria's appeals, I argue, besides her catchy hooks and good looks, is her background story as a Cuban-born exile. Unlike Celia, Gloria did not come of age in Cuba. Her family fled in 1959 when she was 16 months old. Thus, I say she is a one and a half generation Cuban-American. For having been born in Cuba, but not, having, but not having many, if any, memories of it, and having been raised in the U.S. because of a decision made by a parent, right? Not someone who had her own agency, as Celia did at 35 years old. Individuals of this one and a half generational status still feel a deep loyalty to their country of birth. In fact, scholars of the Cuban-American community would label Gloria as a member of the Golden Exiles of 1959 through 1965 that are heralded as the epitome of the Cuban-American community because of their race, educational background, economic status, and political leanings. Estefan's pedigree for selling nostalgic music about Cuba was certified when she shared in interviews that her father was imprisoned by Castro. Her music reflects as much with its deep allegiances to Caribbean sounds and devotion to a free capitalist Cuba. Although her dance-oriented music sometimes dabbles in salsa, her forte is more an Americanized version of Latin music. I interviewed Sergio Rosenblatt. He was director of A&R and marketing at Disco CBS International between 1980 and 1989. And I spoke with him about his work with the Estefans during that time. Emilio wanted to do a bilingual project from the start, but Rosenblatt consistently argued that neither the band nor the company was ready to promote such a record. If you've seen the musical on Broadway, there's a whole scene about that of On Your Feet. After the club success of Dr. Beat, the band struck gold with Gonga, which Rosenblatt described as, quote, a great song with a great mix where we thought we could cut through with a cross-cultural approach. Rosenblatt, who also worked with Celia, stresses that music comes first, ethnicity second. It's a mistake if you do it backwards. When pressed on my theory that it must have been easier to promote Gloria since she is a white Hispanic, he concurred, quote, Gloria is bilingual. She has a degree from the University of Miami. She doesn't have the thick accent that Emilio has. Gloria doesn't necessarily look Latin with that creamy pale skin, end of quote. Rosenblatt's description meshes well with Gloria's status as again, a golden exile. Cherise Curran's study of Cuban American exiles explains how the US's Cuban refugee program strategically racialized Cubans as white to secure their acceptance. Like Jews, Italians, and Greeks before them, Cubans such as Gloria were welcomed into American society when they were eventually deemed white enough. I argue that even if Celia had released more pop-oriented music than, rather than salsa, she would, have been, she would not have enjoyed the same level of success and publicity, especially as Gloria, because of institutional racism, even within the media industry. I asked Rosenblatt if he remembers describing Gloria as Hispanic, Latin, or Cuban-American in press releases. He said that ecumenical labels of Hispanic or Latin usually work better so as to not alienate non-Cubans. Rosenblatt, who is Argentine, acknowledged the diversity of the Latin American community and humorously added, quote, we are naturally separatist, so we didn't want to piss off anyone who was pissed off at the Cubans. When one peruses the popular press clippings of Gloria throughout the 80s, however, Cuba was always mentioned she, when she was, but rarely it's politics. Gloria didn't fully engage on a musical level with Cuba for most of her mainstream career until 1993's Mi Tierra, a stunningly beautiful Spanish language album that is evocative of traditional mid-century Cuban music, but crafted with a top 40 audience in mind. And yet, thinking of how to net the widest audience, the lead single does not mention Cuba. Instead, it reflects a deep, painful yearning for the homeland, a sentiment with which any immigrant can relate. Mi Tierra's chorus offers a searing por portrait of homesickness. You see there, la tierra te duele, la tierra te da, en medio del alma, cuando tú no estás. 
The unique psyche of an exile never fades. In a 2017 interview, Gloria shared that she still has her Cuban passport and she still has the 1959 round trip Pan Am ticket her family used when they arrived in the US. Again, always in exile waiting to return. Her 1998 disco retro dance album, Gloria, features Cuba Libre, her most direct English language lyrical engagement with Cuba. The song starts with Estefan's layered vocals echoing in a major chord over a synth piano. The place that I come from, I barely remember, but the soul of my people will be with me forever. As a tropical percussion cascades with a pulsating dance beat, Gloria continues to sing nostalgically of beautiful memories. One senses a stoic somberness in Gloria's voice until she transitions to Spanish with a more forceful cadence aspiring for a free Cuba. Quiero mi Cuba libre. Quiero, quiero mi Cuba libre, pa que la gente pueda, pa que mi gente que puedan bailar. Like Celia, before her, Gloria takes ownership of the country, mi Cuba, and after two lines of its citizens, mi gente. These possessive determiner noun phrases highlight how Cuban American exiles claim Cubanidad and become spokespersons for people who still live in Cuba. Like Celia's songs, Gloria's do not talk about troubles in the U.S. Pop music, of course, has a history of protest songs and socially conscientious lyrics, but Celia's and Gloria's musical troubles exist only in what was lost in Cuba. In fact, to complain about life in the U.S. would be tantamount to a betrayal of the Cuban-American cause. Exiles worked with the government's desire to taunt the Castro regime with an image of a successful exile community. Any critique of the ills that might accompany life in the U.S. would be ammunition for Castro, and so Celia, Gloria, and their lot embraced the exile model, and specifically the supposedly universal economic success that accompanied exile, which endowed Cubans and the U.S. government with a powerful source of anti-Castro propaganda. Gloria, like Celia, had repeatedly rejected invitations to sing in Cuba, even when Pope John Paul II asked her to do so in 1998. Gloria remained steadfast in her refusal as recently as 2015, a year into the U.S. diplomatic detente with Cuba. Gloria's political views are still in line with those of most Cuban Americans of her generation, anti-Castro, nostalgic, perhaps naively so, for a pre-Castro Cuba, and at least publicly in favor of continuing the economic embargo on Cuba. Although Gloria does not enjoy the same kind of chart success she once did, her name, like so many other celebrities that reach a certain level of fame, is well known and will be for a few decades to come. Listening to Gloria's nostalgic music is now an act of nostalgia itself. This is evidenced in the Broadway show On Your Feet, the story of Emilio and Gloria Estefan, which received several Tony nominations and I think played on Broadway for about two years and is on tour in the U.S. The show, which offers an up-by-your-bootstraps narrative through the Estefan's love story, is a jukebox musical featuring her biggest hits. The narrative's temporal shift from her childhood to her burgeoning career engenders strong links between the Estefan status as a one and a half generation uh, Cuban Americans and how they embrace a hybrid identity in their music and public persona. In one scene, Gloria's mother has a flashback to the night her husband informed her that the family has to flee because he risks being arrested by the Castro regime. Set to the lyrics of Mi Tierra, the scene demonstrates how deeply ingrained the revolution is to the personal identity and narrative of Cuban Americans, even those who were only children or not even born when the revolution occurred. Cuban American exiles perceive Cuban history as starkly divided into the idyllic BC, as we see here in Gloria's shirt, Cuba BC, which stands for before Castro or before communism era and its current post-lapsarian state. Gloria continued to embrace her uniqueness as a Cuban and an American, highlighting this hyphenated identity when Castro died, Fidel. She released a statement that listed his crimes and then transitioned to a more optimistic tone. Quote, may freedom continue to ring in the U.S., my beautiful adopted country. 
and may the hope for freedom be inspired and renewed in the heart of every Cuban in my homeland and throughout the world. As a one and a half Cuban American generation person, she claims the US as her adopted country but continues to see Cuba as her homeland. Gloria's status as a golden exile has been cemented and she now bears the role of the elder stateswoman. In the past four years, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, a Kennedy Center honor, and the Library of Congress's Gershwin Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Popular Music. In the meantime, another Cuban-American artist has been making his rounds on the top of the charts and in the public consciousness of a new generation. That, of course, is Pitbull. Not Bulldog, but Pitbull. <laughs> what comes to mind when you think about Pitbull? 305. Mr. 305. Mr. 305. <laughs> And now Mr. Worldwide, right? He's elevated from the area code. Yeah. So Pitbull, he was born Armando Christian Perez to Cuban parents in Miami in 1981. Pitbull represents what I categorize as a second generation Cuban American. So we had that first with Celia coming as an adult, that one and a half, the ones who immigrate because of their parents' decision, and then one who's not an immigrant, just born in the US to Cuban parents. Although he's not an immigrant, Pitbull is cognizant of the black, oh yeah, I love this gift. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's him, right? Uh, Pitbull is cognizant of the blessings and tensions of being a hyphenated American with such close links to his family's immigrant narrative. Sometimes one can belong too much to one group to be fully accepted in the other. Like many of his generation, Pitbull flirts and negotiates with both sides, attempting to achieve a cohesive personal identity. Beginning with his first mainstream hit, 2008's I Know You Want Me, Calle Ocho, Pitbull has incorporated the sounds he grew up listening to on Miami's radio stations, such as Power 96, to become the master of commercial dance rap. The party-oriented cosmopolitanism of his music thrives on an eclectic soundtrack of 80s new wave, freestyle, Miami bass, early 90s house, gangster rap, traditional salsa, EDM, and tropical house. I've studied all his music. <laughs> Pitbull has amalgamated elements from each of these genres on album tracks and more notably on massively successful commercial singles where he duets with top 40 singers such as Kesha, Jennifer Lopez, Enrique Iglesias, and Christina Aguilera. But Pitbull has a political side. After all, he has an album called Climate Change. All right? Pitbull's lyrics diverge drastically from Celia's and Gloria's because of his nationality, gender performance, and racial identity as a white Hispanic male working in a black-dominated musical genre. He alludes to Cuban politics and history in some of his songs, but mostly works to negotiate his identity as a Cuban-American, regretful about a Cuba he never got to experience, but optimistic about his future as an American. In 2006, he released the song Ya Se Acabo when news broke that Castro transform transferred power to his brother, Raul. <laughs> Pippo opens by repeating the couplet, Ahora empezar de nuevo, ojalá que se caiga el viejo. Now to start anew, hope to God that the old man falls. With a characteristically aggressive and puerile tone. Halfway through the song, he sweetly pays homage to the Cuban-American singers who paved the way for him. Willie ya llegó con la ayuda de Dios. Castro sabe que se acabó. Celia Cruz en el cielo cantando y riéndose, gritando azúcar. His reference to salsa singer Willie Chirino, Chirino, who arrived via the Peter Pan flights as a child in 1960, and the recently deceased Celia, traced a lineage of artists who found success employing traditional music within the American music economy. More importantly, each of them articulated anti-Castro political sentiments that linked them through several generations of immigrant statuses. Many liberals have long seen the U.S. embargo on travel to and commerce with Cuba as a Cold War relic that exists to appease the conservative interests of Cuban Americans in Miami and their disproportionate political power in an electoral swing state. Because most Cuban American exiles in the U.S. are white or light-skinned, Many have also seen the embargo as a racist policy that cares little for the plight of current Cubans, many of whom are black or dark-skinned. Charges of racism reared their head in 2013 when the singer Beyonce and her husband Jay-Z visited Cuba. Although the trip was conducted under the auspices of a people-to-people -people educational exchange program, many critiqued this visit as nothing more than a vacation. Jay-Z penned a track entitled Freestyle in reply to the critics. 
In it, he boasts that he, quote, turned Havana to Atlanta, parading around with cigars and guayaberas in the streets of the Cuban capital as freely as he might in Atlanta. He even asserts that he, quote, got White House clearance. In the second verse, he volleys a political fireball, quote, this communist talk is so confusing when it's from China, the very mic that I'm using. Mm -hmm. These lines underscore what many see as a US government's double standard when it comes to dealing with two communist nations. As Jay-Z notes that the microphone he uses to record these lines was made in China, the irony of the trade embargo on Cuba is crystallized. U.S. Senator Marco Rubio, among others, asked the U.S. government to investigate the legitimacy of the couple's visa and lambasted the pair for not visiting Cubans suffering under the dictatorship, such as hip-hop artists who were on hunger strike to protest censorship in Cuba. Pitbull waded into the controversy by releasing a song called Open Letter Freestyle to support the couple and throw shade at Rubio. I will conclude this presentation by deconstructing the lyrics of this song to interrogate how the track offers a sample of Pitbull's musical meditation on Cuban American identity. The song synthesizes three generations of Cuban American pop stars music, personae, and politics. It expertly mixes the raconturial tr tradition of politically aware rap music narratives with Pitbull's wryly charismatic inflections. Born in Miami right on time, Scarface El Mariel Cuban crime. Let's not act like half our families ain't flipped bricks. We made Miami something from nothing. Let's not forget that we came from nothing. Here, Pitbull situates himself as American born, yet in the heart of the Cuban diaspora. He references negative portrayals of Cuban Americans after the 1980 Mariel exodus in films such as Scarface. Although he argues that Cubans have built Miami into the cosmopolitan city that it is, he does not whitewash those who may have done so through illicit methods. This is an image that works in the world of rap music in which Pitbull plays. Celia and Gloria would never sing about such a thing. Pitbull is of a younger generation that idolizes gritty street life and up from the bootstraps narrative even if it is accompli accomplished through unlawful means. More importantly, the verse has been interpreted by many as a critique of Rubio, whose brother-in-law, Orlando Cecilia, was sentenced to 35 years in prison for his involvement in, in an illegal drug sales operation. And there were big articles on that when Rubio was running for the uh, Republican presidential nomination in 2016. When Pitbull claims, quote, let's not forget that we came from nothing, he belies the preferential treatment that Cuban immigrants have received since the Cuban Readjustment Act of 1966, and the fact that the high education levels experienced with American corporations and light skin color of many Cubans afforded them an easier route to American privilege than other Latino groups. Nonetheless, this line embodies the narrative embedded in the Cuban American mythos of a community that has flourished despite hardship thanks to the opportunities available to them in the US and an unflagging work ethic. Pitbull reifies this uplist Pitbull reifies the uplifting historiography already chronicled by Celia and Gloria. Los judíos del Caribe, ahora están jodidos en el Caribe. Blood is blood, don't act like we anemic. Elian got snatched back, the whole world seen it. Russian missile crisis had America skating on nuclear ice. Bay of Pigs, big bluff. We thought they had our back, but they left us straight stuck. I ain't here to hold a grudge. I love the freedom that has been given to us. Now break down us, get it? U.S., that's right, God bless. Expertly switching between Spanish and English, Pitbull takes pride in the achievements of Cuban Americans compared to other Hispanics in the U.S. With their educational, financial, and political success, the community has often been compared to American Jews who also enjoy a disproportionate amount of power and prestige given their small numbers. Listing the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Bay of Pigs invasion, and the Elian Gonzalez controversy, Pitbull indexes the decades-long tense relationship between Cuba and the U.S. as part of his heritage. Pitbull takes a higher road than endless finger pointing and showcases himself as a proud and grateful American. Like many second-generation Cuban Americans, Pitbull acknowledges the pain of his parents and grandparents, but understands the future cannot be impeded by the past. Here's the freedom we ride for. Here's the freedom we die for. C-U-B-A, hope to see you free one day. Abuela y tía, Sierra Maestra, which led to my mother in Pedro Pan. In Cuba, hit the lotto. That means get your family, search for freedom, and run. Politicians love to hate you, but they run away when it's time to debate you. Question of the night, would they have messed with Mr. Carter if he was white? 
Hmm, rhyme with treasury. One way or another, in Cuba's where they'll bury me. Happy fifth year anniversary, JMB. Don't worry, it's on me. Y para todo el mundo en Cuba, con la ayuda de Dios, nos vemos pronto. Dale. <laughs> Pipple weaves iconic elements of Cuban American culture in his song as he returns to his main focus, supporting Beyonce and Jay Z's trip to Cuba, even if some thought it flouted U.S. restrictions on travel there. Voicing doubt over Raul's ta talk of change in Cuba under the leadership he assumed when Fidel stepped down, Pipple cynically aligns Raul under the nonpartisan ecumenical umbrella of the quote, politicians who love to hate you. Since Pipple has not expressed a desire to perform in a communist Cuba, one may imagine that he is aligned with Celia and Gloria in su supporting an embargo on the island, even if it is in just some forms. Nonetheless, he brings up race and asks whether the couple would have been attacked with such hostility if they were not black. The white pit bull crosses racial lines to support his fellow rapper while betraying the traditional political beliefs of his ethnic group, many of whom do not support American travel to Cuba. Pitbull's community is one of music and free expression, even when it's controversial. This transgression resembles how Celia crossed racial lines to support Republicans because her identity was firmly ensconced within the Cuban American ethnic community. Pitbull did not release a statement upon, Cuba, upon Castro's death. In an interview after Fidel's death, Pitbull struck a circumspect note. Quote, Castro, to me, died when he handed off power to his brother. I'm not going to celebrate anybody's death. But to me, he's been dead, to be honest with you. So hopefully, this is a path and a step in the right direction to see Cuba Libra de Verdad and it not just be a drink. <laughs> Pitbull's relatively terse response underscores how his 2006 track already rendered Castro impotent so as to focus on celebrations. As he has gone from dubbing himself, as we mentioned, from Mr. 305, which is the area code for Dade County, Miami, where we're from, to Mr. Worldwide, a financially savvy Pitbull understands that he must protect global commercial enterprises that include a record company, merchandise, and concert festivals. Incre increasingly, he now must guard his reputation as a philanthropist. He runs a series of charter schools that focus on sports and arts and was feted in the news media in 2017 for lending his private jet to charter cancer patients from a Hurricane Irma ravaged Puerto Rico to the U.S. mainland. Pitbull is a second generation Cuban American who has an undying love for his ancestor homeland, but is focused on achieving the American dream of financial success. Pitbull's wish to be buried in Cuba, notably a free one, is similar to that expressed by Celia. Pitbull's Cuban identity is an emphatically mediated one and stands out more so because he was not born in Cuba. This song trades a nostalgia by cataloging Cuban history through the Cuban American lens that sees it divided before and after 1959. And yet, despite Pitbull's ambivalence towards a rigid embargo against Cuba, one in line with many Cuban American millennials, 65% 65 of whom oppose the embargo, according to FIU's 2018 poll, he still shares an intergenerational hope with Celia and Gloria of free Cuba. So, in conclusion, the musical politics of Celia Cruz, Gloria Stefan, and Pitbull are heavily indebted to the Cuban-American immigration narrative that took place after 1959's communist revolution. Without fail, these artists have expressed a rigid and disciplined anti-Castro discourse in their interviews and public personae. As Cuban-born artists, Celia and Gloria often sing of an idyllic, even Edenic, pre-Castro Cuba. Gloria leaves the terrain of salsa for the Cuban born and raised Celia and establishes herself as an American top 40 wordsmith. Yet the imagery and rhythms of Celia's and Gloria's songs evoke nostalgia for Cuba that is unreachable because it is history and fantasy at once. Pitbull, steeped in the rawness of hip hop, engages more explicitly with the hardline politics of Cuba because he was born and raised in the exile community of Miami wherein such discourse is commonplace. Having never set foot on the island, his lyrics are underscored by experiencing Cuba as an outsider. More American than Cuban in many ways, Pitbull unleashes invectives against Cubans and American politicians with the brash confidence of someone who has always enjoyed the privileges of the First Amendment. Despite their differences in terms of age, gender, racial identity, and generational status, the three artists have assured their success by carefully negotiating their place in the mainstream music market by employing the Cuban American vernacular to trade in the universal themes of love, loss, nostalgia, and hope. Thank you. Thank you. Extraordinary, extraordinary depth.
in terms of your interpretation. Thank you. So we now have, let me see, 45 minutes for questions and comments and drinking more wine and yes. eating more <laughs> cheese and crackers. So feel free, don't be shy about getting more wine or whatever. Uh, and who would like to start with the questions? Yeah. Uh, what, what are Cubans in Cuba's, like historically, what were their reactions to Celia and Gloria given the criticism of the Cuban government? And I assume given that there were all these requests for them to visit that there were at least some Cubans who actually really liked them. Right, I assume, and I've, I've asked this to people who've been to Cuba, uh, you know, since having left or people who immigrated later, and this is just anecdotal, yeah. so I have, you know, I would be interested to do research on that. But some people are like, Celia who? And Gloria who? Because the music <laughs> is not sold in any stores and is not played on any radio station. Mm -hmm. It is officially banned because there are gusanos, which are worms, people who left Cuba. Uh, but the music has been smuggled in, is what I've heard from people. You know, oh, whether yeah. it's on USB yeah, drives, can, records. You can pick it up on the radio very easily. Oh, so coming from other, yeah. Radio stations. Um, so I think that's all anecdotal. I don't, I don't know enough of, <laughs> about that. Let's ask a couple. Maybe people who have more experience there know that. I remember when I visited Cuba when I was 10, um, I stayed in Pueblo Matanza, and I remember Billy Chirino's music was banned as well. Mm. If you played Billy Chirino's music, you would go to jail. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking down the street and hearing his music. So people were still supporting it and playing it, and they didn't care. But another example is Solano Matancera. Solano Matancera is one of those amazing men that historically, you know, my grandpa and this is with my parents. I love, I have a collection of those records. I went to Matanza last year, to my second time to Cuba. I wanted to get in, like, went to Matanza to visit to see what was left of nobody knew. Hmm. You know, which is like a I couldn't believe, you know, I went to the town where they came from hmm. and I was asking, I went to see, I went to the museum of the city to see if there was some records. Nobody knew one. I was so sad. Let's ask some of the people who are Cubans from Cuba. Okay, so I grew up listening to the Celia Cruz music. And in Cuba, there is no one disco, I mean, the club, nightclub, that there, it no, doesn't play the music of people right now. Mm. And I mean, it's quite simple. There is no Cuban who doesn't know Carnaval, the one of the most famous uh, songs of Celia Cruz. So. Harold? Okay. Um, I think there is the, the, the government policy mm -hmm. right. with this artist, and there is reality. Of course. <laughs> they are technically banned from radio, usually or they were for a long time. And the reality was that in the streets, many people were playing that. And in my experience growing up in the 90s, I imagine that the 80s or 70s were different. But in the 90s, you could play Willy Chirino in the middle of the street. And everybody knew that that was not legal maybe, but mm -hmm. nothing happened to you. <laughs> so the, you know, there is, it's not legal or illegal, it's illegal. It's something in between there. <laughs> when I, when, when I when I was thinking of congratulations on the presentation, it's amazing. Thank I'm, you. I'm very yeah. surprised. What I was, I was thinking when you were talking about Celia, and I wanted to ask you, how much do you think that that the country they are idealizing and being nostalgic about is the real country that it was, mm -hmm. and do you think that the country that Celia is re remembering, that she has the average experience of the of the of the Cuban black community in Cuba mm. because what I think is that there is also a class issue mm -hmm. underlying here you know mm -hmm. they remember something that was available to people like them but not maybe not to many other people mm -hmm. so I think that this is this we have a lot to talk about this but right congrats. yeah and with, and with Celia as well she didn't write her songs you know she collaborated with songwriters so her songwriters could have been white Cubans or Puerto Ricans, uh, you know, Fania Records. They just pumped out records here from New York in the 1970s in the height of the salsa movement. So who knows, you know, all the different songwriters. And um, so you're asking like the, the idealization, idolization, this, this idyllic. To me, I also, I did another presentation at a conference comparing 
talking about the intersections and tropes of Latin music and country music, you know, as forms of ethnic music. And think about country music that idolizes rural life, right? And also just as like these vignettes where you don't see the hard parts of living in poverty in Appalachia or Texas or whatnot. So I think it's just a, a part of the marketability of the music. And she's not someone who wanted to be political, um, it, it, like the other artists may have been. So I think there's just something about that musical style, that, like, like country as well, that idealization is just a common trope. I don't know if that's what you're speaking to, like in terms of the US, version of it or you're saying how the country sees itself so. oh the u.s the US. yeah yeah one, one more thing yeah. also um i think that in a polarized uh, reality like like the exile and the cubans in the island that sometimes gets very heated and polarized mm -hmm. because you have two different narratives one of the biggest issues has been that both sides want to have the uh, uh, the monopoly over over the pain suffer you know, both sides want to have the monopoly mm. of we have suffered so much mm. and they fail systematically to recognize that the others also also suffer. And I think that there's a, there's a lack of empathy mm. within this in Cuba and in Florida mm. that has been part of the problem and it reflects very well in the songs. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I pointed out those lyrics, right, where uh, like Gloria takes ownership of Cuba, right? Her people and her island. Uh, I remember even reading articles um, you remember the diaz Balart family? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them were in state politics, federal politics. I mean, I, I, don't, I think in Florida, right? I don't know if these were rumors or whatnot, but people talked about it that like they were planning to, for when Cuba was free to become, you know, president or governor of Cuba if it was annexed by the U.S. Like there were all these plans for Cuban exiles to return, take over everything. But it's like, well, we haven't been there in 50 years now, so things have changed and, you know, that mindset had to eventually change. But yeah, that, that tension, and, and you see that with, and that's why I was, you know, that's, as you said, you know, a whole other topic, but even tensions between Cuban Americans who came in 59 versus 69, 79, 89, 99, 09, and the way that each one looks down on the other because of the more time they spent in Cuba, they might be more communist, or now they're only coming for economic reasons, they're not coming for political reasons. And that's why the law changed now, um, the, the, the readjustment, I forget which one specifically, but just in the last three years, that Cubans now are treated like all other immigrants. They are no longer given that free pass, um, as of just, I believe, two or three years ago. And even it, Rubio it supported that. right at the end. Of I the Obama was, administration. Yeah, late 20s. Uh, 16, 2017. Right. Um, you had a question? Yeah, John. Um, a couple of things. One is, I hate to be too cynical, but part of success in popular music is not necessarily what you feel, it's what you feel the audience wants you to feel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how, what, whether Celia has in fact forgotten about the the reality of being black in Cuba or whether she's singing to an audience that, that can't acknowledge that reality and has no sensibility about it. You know, the question of popular success in music is not necessarily legitimate, not necessarily authenticity, it's the image of authenticity. Right, so, absolutely. A um, couple other things. I somewhere heard that Gloria and her husband had a brief flirtation with Cuba, that they visited Cuba and that they seem to, and I don't know if it was the, the Carter era or when it was, but they seemed to be wanting to play a breakthrough role and then they were, it was explained to them do that. <laughs> that was not on at this <laughs> point. But they're also, that they did play this sort of weird role with Obama. Yes. I mean, whether they were, identifying with the Saladrigas and the mm -hmm. sort of the engagement portion or whether they were the pullback portion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I don't, the, the other two other things that I would say, one is on the black, the, uh, this has not been noted so much, but a Cuban friend of mine sent me a note last week that on Cuban television um, and in the Council of Ministers or one of the higher government, there was a major discussion of race and an acknowledgement that race was a problem in Cuba. Yeah, recently. Yeah, yeah like yeah. a week ago. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, that. a week <laughs> ago. I mean, it was like, as he wrote, and it was embraced. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, it was a total flip of the revolution's self, 
mythology. Um, the other thing I wanted, I wondered about, because I had a lot of experience with Vietnam. At this point, there is a total integration of Vietnamese American and Vietnamese music. I mean, it's like I'm Irish American. The integration of Irish American and Irish traditional music. I mean, the extent to which the the source is Vietnam for Vietnamese American music and the entertainers, their CDs are sold here, they perform here. Um, there isn't any more of a distinction than there is between Irish and Irish American. There are differences for sure, but it's a flow between the, the cultures and the expatriate cultures or exile culture gains a life and the indigenous, the home culture, gains a life mm. from that. Now, Cuba, I mean, forget about all these top known people. Well, there's some that are top known. I mean, Isaac Delgado comes back, comes to Miami to, because of family reasons, because of inheritance reasons. Um, but he performs and is accepted in, in Miami and then goes back to Cuba and you know, there was a little, it was a difficult period, but essentially he's totally integrated in both sides of the straits as a performer. Cuban comedians mm -hmm. are totally integrated on both sides of the straits. I mean, it's, the question is whether post Obama, there is now a whole reality that is affecting in all kinds of human ways. I mean, Lord knows how many girlfriends and boyfriends and <laughs> boyfriends and boyfriends and girlfriends and girlfriends there are in in the relationship in the musical world at this point. I mean, I know somebody who was had a, lost his radio show because he said something positive about legalizing marijuana. So he just moved to Miami where his son was and their his grandchildren. And his son was one of the most popular Cuban musicians in, uh, in Miami. So, you know, it's like this, this fluidity. I mean, if Obama, I mean, Obama did many things, but his opening of the doors between the pieces of the culture seems to me a, a phenomenally important thing that's going on right now. And, you know, Rubio and, and Claver Caron are a year from now, they will be history, but uh, we still have to deal with them, and they're still going to screw us for another year. But yeah, yeah thank you for those comments. And the part about Gloria's politics, obviously, I cut a lot. To, <laughs> yeah. I, hopefully, I didn't talk for too long, but I definitely cut a lot. <laughs> uh, that was only something that I found out about recently, and I think my mom told me. You know, people <laughs> in Miami talk. And she's like, I heard, and I kind of looked it up, and they, yeah, like, Gloria and Emilio did go back to Cuba perhaps in the late 70s or early 80s before they were super big. Um, late 70s. I, late 70s, I think, to get Emilio's family and bring them. And that, that's what I heard, and maybe I, I, I want to look more into that. But that's something they never mention. If they did mention it early on, as you said, especially, you know, when like Jorge Mas and the Cuban American Natural Foundation, you know, like you are not going to say those things. Because uh, uh, that, that shocked me when I, when I heard that, you know. Because <clears throat> Emilio came way after. Gloria, I believe, and his family. So my mom was, uh, what's her name? La Flaca, uh, Lilia <laughs> Stefan. She was one of my mom's students, and she said, yeah, so it was yeah. funny. So I've heard about that. And then with their politics, uh, they, they say they're nonpartisan, but they hosted a fundraiser for Obama for his second election, I believe, at their house. Uh, and but you know, Gloria, she's one of those people, and they say this, like, if a president invites us to the White House, we will go to the White House, because we are immigrants and we're still odd, uh, in awe of a president wanting to invite us to the White House. So they'll go whether it's Republican or Democrat. And they've said that post-Trump. They have said that. Yeah, I think, <laughs> somebody, I think, I think somebody was asking them, would you go with Trump, you um, know, that situation. Uh, but we know that they're, uh, you know, her and Pitbull, for example, in Miami have been engaged in protests supporting the ladies in white, you know, those mothers in Cuba who are protesting their children being imprisoned. Uh, Not their children, generally their spouses. Oh, spouses, okay. Uh, they, so that she's still very involved in those politics, but yeah, partisan-wise, 
they try to, because of the politics, even as it changes in Miami, it's still such a heated issue. But they did post that Obama fundraiser. So, I mean, that has to show that they supported him over, who was that, McCain that year, or Romney, so. But they've also, they also gave money for Diaz Balart and for some of the other Cubans. For some of the Cubans. Local, uh, so yeah. they. Yeah, but I guess they don't have quite a litmus test or, you know, it's a little no, bit they, more. No, they've not the identified with either Democrats or Republicans. They've given money okay. um, to some of the most conservative Cuban American members of Congress, as well as Obama. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two questions. You'll have to speak up. Um, uh, my question is that if you can comment um, as to how Celia's, um, you know, challenges that Cuban identity um, here in America, like her herself, like not being from Havana, and her herself being um, an Afro uh, Latina, and like you know, that being visible through her, her. Um, not only physicality, but the way that she dressed, mm -hmm. right? Like her, the use of wigs, the use of um, mm -hmm. lentejuelas, the use of colors. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if you can um, comment as to how their background um, also like shaped their music, right? As I, 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 as I'm, I, I don't know if I'm mistaken, but like I remember Celia being a janitor, um, Celia Cruz being a janitor and working at a school, and actually the, the term Azúcar like came from that because like when she was like cleaning, um, she you know would approach the kids and she would say like Azúcar kid like as, a, as a, like you know to bright them up to be like um, cheer up and so like how and and you know contrasting that to um, um, Gloria Stefan's husband um, Emilio Stefan who is a producer mm -hmm. himself and so how um, you know those unequal um, um, Starting not only like shape their music, but also they are they are they are sh um, you know in some way like um, shape their path towards their 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 later success. Right, that's a lot to unpack. And I'm, I've never heard of that though. So, you know, was she like a janitor here then, or because I know in Cuba she was studying to be a teacher and then you know got into the music business afterwards, but I've not heard of that before. That's really interesting. In the U.S., yes, really? she wow. used to be a janitor herself. So just make um, ends meet. Yeah, this was mentioned in the, um, there was an NPR um, that came up with a, with a podcast that um, talked about salsa mm -hmm. um, and had like how salsa came, you know, was a, 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 a one of the genres that is very um, inclusive of many genres, right? Like mm -hmm. song, as you as you mentioned, song, uh, right. and, 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 and other uh, mambo, rumba, mm -hmm. um, and, and an amalgamation of that. And so I'm curious as to see how, um, you know, sort of that background also like shaped their 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 music and in their in their in their career, right. um, and also you know also their lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. Like in 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 that um, experience also like helped the. The, the audience to to identify with the music. I myself not Cuban, but when I listen to Celia's songs, I immediately um, engage and relate to that um, because she speaks to a larger um, a struggle that I think in a broader scale, the Latin American community can relate to. Right, and I think that ties into what you were saying about you know pop music and thinking of like marketability, palatability, that idea of authenticity. And so there, there's that issue, you know, when we talk about like, well, she didn't write her songs, but, you know, she agrees to what song she's going to record and perform, right? And especially in, with Sasa, that kind of improvisation skills that she has there. Um, I know there's a lot of people who studied her from that race perspective, right? I think there's like a, I forget whose work it is, has a, this title is called like Bananas and Buttocks. And it's like women in Latin America and like sexualization and objectification and whatnot uh, in terms of how they sell themselves or how they're marketing, going to like Carmen Miranda, right, with the bananas on her head and things like that. Um, I know there's even been a whole essay on Celia Cruz's um, high heels, you know, and her shoes and what that does for femininity or ideas of feminism. So, yeah, I mean, like you're saying, like you almost 
I don't know if you say, you say you can almost feel Cuban when you listen to her music, but you know, that embodiment is what she's selling, right? That identity of everything that's there, that mixture of race, gender, class, maybe that janitorial background, I don't know. Um, and I think, I, I, I guess I tried to play, to work in, work that into the analysis of, again, the identity is a posturing, right? I keep saying the public persona who they actually are when they go into their private lives doesn't matter, right? It's about what they are selling. That's why, you know, Gloria is not going to bring that up, that she did visit once uh, before it was even more verboten to do so. Uh, and that you're going to have this political posturing that is part of your identity. Uh, because being Cuban American is about deciding where you fall on that political spectrum. And do you see it as BC, Cuba, or not? And are you invested in promoting that nostalgia? And then what else is inherent in that? So I kind of don't know how to answer your question because it's like, it's everything to what, what they're trying to do and selling their music and their persona and, and their interviews as well. Just like Hiroka Celia, even all her time in the US, she allegedly didn't pick up English, right? Her, her tagline was, uh, my English is not very pretty, is yeah. what she would say, you know, with a very <laughs> thick accent. And you think, and you think, uh... Mark Anthony? Mark Anthony took that line too. Oh, yeah. My English is not very good. Yeah, and those are one of the things that's almost like those quips that all celebrities have, like Dolly Parton, think about how much her identity is wrapped up into her music and her quips during interviews, right? Like, it takes a lot of money to look this cheap, right? It's the same thing as <laughs> Celia saying that my English is not too pretty. And then we like it, where it's very endearing to us, whether it's accurate or not. Right. So, I don't know. That doesn't answer your question because I don't know how to answer it almost. <laughs> Yeah. Quick follow-up to that one. Uh, yeah. Since all of this is completely new to me, did Celia come as a star from Cuba, or did she develop into a star when she got here? She was already a star in the Latin American world, and she immigrated to Mexico first before coming to the U.S. She had been living there for years. Mm -hmm. um, when, like, as he was talking about La Sonora Matancera, was a huge hit in Cuba. She replaced, oh, I forget her name, but there was a popular singer, Mirta, or someone, um, when she went, um, she moved back to Puerto Rico to have a child. So La Sonora Matancera was already a very well-known band, and then Celia became the lead singer, and they became even more popular, and they became popular throughout Latin America. Mm -hmm. And then so when she moved here, what I think is very interesting is that Celia chose to live here, in the New York, New Jersey area, instead of in the heartland of Miami. And one is because the salsa industry, Fania Records, was headquartered here, all the Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, it just made more sense. But maybe there also was that racial difference that the Cuban American community is white dominated in Miami. It's much more liberal and mixed in New Jersey mm -hmm. and New York. Because think of uh, Bob, Men Bob Menendez, right? The, the yeah, senator from New Jersey, he's a Democrat. Rubio from Miami is a Republican. And then we have Ted Cruz, who's a Republican, half Cuban, you know. Um, so there is some of that. Yeah, so she was established. Mm -hmm. yeah. See? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's less important, especially like that FIU poll shows that fewer and fewer Cuban Americans support the embargo, especially because, you know, like our grandparents are dying, people from that older generation. So it's a generational difference. So the numbers are different. And the newer Cuban immigrants don't tend to not support that, especially because they're like, I want to go home. I still have a lot of family there. Uh, whereas that first generation, the entire family tended to move, right, in those first years of exile. But who I was thinking about was Camila Cabello. Mm -hmm. So she's a Cuban-American singer. What is she, 20 years old? Uh, you know, and she had a number one hit, Havana, right? That's the name of the song, earlier this year. So uh, we don't know enough about her yet and how often she talks about or is asked about Cuban-American politics. And it's interesting because she was born in Cuba to a Cuban mother and Mexican father. So she has a very unique identity and then I believe came to the U.S. as a, a tween, you know, like a 12 or 13 year old. Uh, but I don't think, you know, she would be, she's just like in another sphere, in a different sphere, you know, because Gloria was the Miami sound machine. Pitbull is Mr. 305. They are tied to Miami, whereas she is not in the same way. 
He was so. on Saturday Night Live <clears throat> yeah. this week. Oh, good, yeah. yeah. So if you know, yeah, if you haven't heard of her, Camila Cabello, she's the new generation. So we'll see. But I haven't seen her in interviews talking explicitly about the politics there. The, yeah, ironically for me, you, you can listen to people in every disco in Cuba, but at this point in Miami, there is a strong campaign to cancel culture or, boy, or boycott all the artists that play in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So there is a strong movement in Florida right now to ban any artists in, to play in the United States that currently plays also in Cuba. So there is some kind of political censorship still around this, this uh, the, the Cuban uh, Florida argument. So. Yeah, because I remember in the 1990s the big controversy when Los Van Van yeah. were going to perform in Miami, mm -hmm. and that was, I believe, shut and down. Juanes and, and when Juanes was yeah. performing in Cuba, and that's why you know Gloria always says no, Pitbull always says no to those invitations. Uh, I don't think it's as vitriolic as it was in the 90s, as hostile as it was in the 1990s, but there is still some controversy because you see Cuban artists coming through all the time in Miami now. And I think the community has just changed, its political interests have changed a little bit. There's some people that are just not going to go, of course, to those concerts. Uh, but yeah, it's still, it's, it's pretty exciting in Miami. Right. Carlos <laughs> Varela, Chima Funk, they've all played Miami recently. But the, the, the move for us up, he, they wanted to take uh, the keys of the city of Miami out from Gente de Zona because they played in Cuba recently. Oh. And there was a big argument about that. And mm. The concerts that Buenafé had planned in Miami were canceled mm. and other concerts of another group also yeah. was canceled in Florida. So yeah. that's, that's something that is, is still, still going on. Okay. And the curious thing is that they still have support from government officials, local government officials. Mm -hmm. Republican yeah, I think you, you still have to toe the line in Miami politics, especially yeah. with the with the embargo. Even if you're a Democrat, Cuban American, you have to toe a line. I mean, and it's not just towing the line; they are also strongly held beliefs by people. So, yeah. Last couple questions, comments. Yes, John. The question, though, going further on this is, as you cut generations, I mean, I think that Harold's right, and that if you're talking about where official opinion can influence things, that the older generation still has a lot of weight. But mm -hmm. the question is, in terms of what's actually happening in people's minds, <laughs> spirits that are 30 or five or younger, I mean, is, it's not just that they're from a different generation, but I suspect that they do have more of a sense of a single culture with different wings rather than cultures in conflict with each other. But that, that may be wishful thinking on my part, but, mm. but that's the impression. And, and also the sense within Cuba, I mean, the people here were asking about the, well, isn't their music banned? Well, Yes, as, a, as Harold and Gretchen said, yes and no, but a now even less, mm. <laughs> uh, partially because the media is now so fluid. I mean, what comes in on a flash drive um, and what is then reproduced and distributed um, just makes any effort to try to control it. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know, is there any effort to stop stuff coming over the internet as you know people get their music over the internet they don't uh, they don't even flash drives or right. something of the past and you know i don't i've never heard of cuba trying to block people getting music from the u.s uh, isn't it still hard to get internet service in cuba like right. wi-fi is almost impossible no it's that you're talking a year ago or two years ago. I mean, it's, you know, it's like now everybody's got their freaking phone yeah. uh, with it. It's expensive. Yeah. It's expensive. But expensive is a different issue. Yeah. Well, that makes it inaccessible yeah. in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the it was expensive here at the beginning. Low prices. Sort of the a, number, yeah. the percentage of Cubans who have access, particularly via their cell phones, mm -hmm. is... Can, the survey suggests it's over 50 percent, mm -hmm. but the issue is then, you know, paying 
for the access. Yeah, and the bandwidth, the how much you can get. Yes, precisely. You but have a because yet? of the paquete and other elements, you know, oh, yeah. people do have the thing. I started going to Cuba in the early 70s, and by the 80s, you know, Celia Cruz, you'd walk down the street, you'd hear Celia Cruz. Mm -hmm. There was no, you know, no, no policemen were running around saying you can't play that. <laughs> Everybody was playing it, so I mean, you know, it's music I think is one of the elements that most permeates uh, the Cuban community in the U.S. and the Cuban community in Cuba. And Carlos Varela has been coming in now for close to 20 years to the States. Uh, Chima Funk is a more recent uh, phenomenon, etc. But even today, famous last words, I hope I don't hex it. In terms of visas, artists, particularly musicians, can get U.S. visas much more easily than scholars uh, can, etc. So they're kind of treated differently. Is there back there a video? No, oh, I can keep saying it. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, the documentary was dedicated to Celia. Oh, nice. And it was very hard, but we got to play it. Uh, we got to make the premiere in the Film Festival of Havana. So that was that was a good thing. I just wanted to add one last thing. I think a key, mom, a key moment in Florida for Cuban Americans in, in, and, and U.S. Cuban cultural relations was when Bam Bam and, and Charanga Vanera started going to, to, to started coming to the U.S. to play. And the parents that didn't want the children to go to the concerts couldn't stop the children. And the arguments, the generational argument between a father mm -hmm. that don't want his children listening to any communist music, and the children say that he doesn't care because he still likes the music, that kind of argument was an interesting thing that happened. And that I think that break the ice between the 90s and the beginning of the century. Mm. Yeah. And kind of speaking to that and what you were saying, even though something that just came to my mind was Cuban American identity. Like, I want to read a study just on what it means. I mean, I know there are some on it, but like for those of us who are of Cuban descent, but we are Americans, like what is our, like what is our culture? You're talking about like this one culture, like it's a, it's a different culture than those who immigrated at any age versus those of us who've never been there but it informs so much of who we are. And it's, and then versus a young, people who might be chronologically younger than us, but immigrate from Cuba, and then we all claim Cubanidad, right? But to me and my family, ours is the right Cuban version, the pre-1959 that <laughs> we have been preserving in Miami, versus someone comes over from 2005, and they're like, well, we've been there all this time after, and here are some new traditions or something, you know? So it's just very different, it's not, you know, I was playing with these terms first, one and a half, and second, but that also depends on the year of arrival. So, I don't know, there's a lot. Yeah, because even like some of these bands, like, I haven't heard of them. So, you know, but that's because maybe my age as well. Ah. And I just like, I like mainstream. That's why I'm looking at, you know, most successful, not people who are, you know, like on the yeah. jazz circuit or the funk circuit. Those people are not the ones that are gonna be playing on the radio, selling millions of records. So I look at kind of the, the big impact is what I like to look at. Yeah. Well, let me just say one totally different thing. There is a rumor, there are many rumors, that in the next few days um, the U.S. might move to close the embassies. The Cuban embassy again? The Cuban embassy the US in Washington, embassy. the U.S. Oh. embassy in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Whether it would be formally the end of normalization, mm. shifting back to intersections. It, I mean, it is an issue at play. Mm. People in Congress are objecting to it, you can guess who's pushing it, uh, sort of the wet dream of Rubio and Mother Caron, and they see things beginning to fray for Trump, so this may be their last mm. chance to do this. 
if it happens, I hope that everybody immediately calls whoever their senators and representatives are and ask them to object powerfully to that because if there's a new president that will reverse, but it will take a while to build back up and you know stop it. Trying to resist that change is very important. So sorry to end a lovely evening with yes. that. <laughs> It is a reality. Thank you, John. Yeah. My member of Congress is Jerry Nadler, so he's busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell him to add this yeah. as, as one other, one other, for instance, of the president's carrying out policies in very much of interests. I mean, it's really now. More importantly, where is the closest good Cuban restaurant for dinner? Uh, right here uh, in New Jersey. Oh no, here. Yeah. Florida, Florida. Florida. Oh, that's what you mentioned? Okay, maybe that's where we're going to go. <laughs> go up that way. Thank you again, Dr. Crahan. Thank you Thank all you. for being well, here. Thank you. Really appreciate it.